Hey, this is Jessica, your web church host. Welcome to Calvary FL Online. We're so blessed to have you join us today, along with viewers from all over the world. We consider you family and count it an honor that you feel blessed by this ministry. If you'd like to share what God is doing in your life, please email us at stories at calvaryfl.com. Also, if you would like to give or be a part of what God is doing at Calvary, you can do so by logging on to calvaryfl.com or by giving through our Calvary FL app. Thank you for joining us for today's worship experience. Right now, you ought to clap Jesus. your hands. You ought to shout. You ought to give him praise. Come on, he's been better to you than that. No, you just stand there. He didn't save you. You just stand there. You don't have a reason to praise him. Jesus. You just stand there. Let everybody else praise him on your road. He ain't made a way out of no way for you. He didn't answer your prayer. No, you ought to praise him like he's been good, 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 good Jesus. to you. My goodness, stand for the reading of God's word. If you're ready, shout, I'm ready. And give this worship team a God bless you. They have led nonstop and took us in. Listen, I'm honor bound to tell you that this is the season God is shifting things in your life. Come on, don't go on what you feel. Go on this prophetic word. Somebody say shift. I see children shifting. I see sons shifting, daughters shifting. I see mindsets shifting. I see situations shifting. I see churches shifting. Come on. I see families shifting. If you're ready to, for God to do a supernatural shift in your life, make a little noise in the room right now. I'm ready. The Lord sovereignly spoke to me. He said, this is the time of the shift. And he said, if you dismiss it, you will miss it. Wave at me if you're not going to dismiss it, but you're going to embrace it. Now, I'm here today on assignment. The Word uh, has been great each night. Evangelist Nathan Marks preached such a phenomenal message last night. But, you know, today we brought in a special speaker. Uh, he's a young preacher named Jim Rayleigh, and I'm ready to do my part. Come on. We're looking at Exodus 28, 41, Exodus 28, 41, and then Leviticus 8, 10. I'm going to really preach today, so you better fasten your seatbelt. Tighten your weave. Come on. Because I'm about to preach today. Exodus 28, 41. Now check this out. And thou shalt put them on Aaron thy brother and his sons with him and shall anoint them, note the pronoun them, and consecrate them and sanctify them that they, pronoun they, pronouns them, may minister to me in the priest's office. And then I want you to look at Leviticus 8 and I'm going to skip down to verse 12. It said, and he poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him in Exodus 28 we re we read about a common anointing that is for them everybody has it those that were of the priesthood each priest received it but then there was an uncommon anointing that came on one man this was the anointing that was signified by the personal pronoun him this gave this man access to the unexplainable this gave this man access to the holy of holies. This gave this man access behind the veil to the miracle zone. I wonder if there's anybody in this room that wants to move beyond just to I'm saved and I'm cute anointing and move into an anointing that gives you access to something you can't explain. Oh, I better ask you again. How many in this room are ready to have access into a realm that you don't even know how to describe what's happening? I'm going to teach this word today for a few minutes called the uncommon anointing. Lift those uncommon hands because God is about to release you into the realm of the supernatural. 
Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for uncommon people lifting uncommon hands, ready to receive the shift in their life by the uncommon anointing of an uncommon God. I pray today that no flesh would be glorified, but the name of Jesus will be magnified. And this would be more than a message and a sermon. This would be an impartation and an invitation into a brand new season of supernatural manifestation. We give you glory for the uncommon. Thank you, uncommon God, for this uncommon time in Jesus' name. And all the uncommon people, bring him an uncommon praise. Will you do it? <laughs> praise the Lord. You might be seated. Let's go together. Here we read in this text in Exodus and Leviticus, it compiles the story of when the priesthood was anointed by Moses. Moses anointed, the Bible says, them in Exodus 28. And this was a collective anointing that came on the entire priesthood. Aaron and all of his sons received this anointing. Now through this common anointing, they had access to the secondary realm, to the inner court. Because if you understand that we're going to go deep today, so put your arm floaties on and let's jump into the deep end of the pool. How many of you are ready to go deep with pastor this morning? Now watch this. The wilderness tabernacle is divided up in the Old Testament into three parts. There's the outer court, there's the inner court, and then there is the holy of holies. Now, this common anointing that all the priesthood received gave access to the outer court and the inner court. This was a common anointing that every priest who served in the tabernacle, they received that from Moses. But then there was an uncommon anointing that came on one man. It was that way throughout Jewish history. This one man was the the high priest and he had access to go behind the veil into the realm of no explanation. Now, in the outer court, it was outside. And everything that was done by the priest in this outer court, it was done in natural light. It represents the flesh realm. It represents the realm where we've got to see it, touch it, taste it, feel it, or hear it, or we don't experience it. It's that realm that is experienced only in the five senses. And much of the church lives in that natural realm. You serve a supernatural God but you're bound by natural laws and many people live their Christian walk out there in that natural realm but then there is a progression there is a secondary level that secondary level is called the inner court every priest had access watch it now to the inner court they could come into that court with that common anointing and even though it represents promotion and even though it represents going to another level still that priest somehow had his foot out there in that natural world because he needed somebody to bring bring him bread for the table of showbread. He was still relying on somebody to bring him oil for the lamp. So it represents in our lives the times when we progress. We're not where we used to be, but there is still more. So often we stand in that secondary realm and we're depending on a man. We need a man to bring us a job, a man to bring us a breakthrough, a man to bring us the bread, a man to bring us the oil, a man to break us through. But see, there was another level. There was another dimension called the realm of no explanation. It was called the holy of holies. In that realm, there was no explanation for the light, the power, the goings on, the presence, the manifestation the things that happened behind the veil it defied human explanation it was supernatural but so many people they get caught in that first realm and they're only in the flesh realm and then some people progress a little bit and they get to the secondary realm but they've still got their foot in that natural world depending on natural men to bring them natural things but God brought me here to tell somebody that the next thing that comes your way a man Man ain't gonna bring it to you and a man ain't gonna make it happen and a man ain't gonna manifest it 
God is about to take some uncommon people with an uncommon anointing into a realm where you walk in and you won't be able to explain how the children got saved. It's the realm of no explanation. You'll feel one day and there'll be a lump. The next moment it will be gone. You won't be able to explain how the deliverance came. It is the realm of no explanation. People will ask you, how did the finances turn around? How did the miracle manifest? How did the door open? How did the lump dry up? How did the cure come? How did the broken place get put back together? How did the church explode? How did the thing happen? How did the family get restored? And you'll say, I don't know. All I know is that I got under an uncommon anointing and I stepped into a realm of supernatural and now things are happening in my life that I cannot even explain. I shifted. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but somebody is about to step out of your world and into his. You're about to step out of the natural and into the supernatural. You're about to step out of containment. You're going to break it in the name of Jesus and things are going to begin to manifest in your life where your children will supernaturally be set free where they'll be addicted one day and they'll be delivered the next. They'll be in prison one moment. They'll be free the next. You'll be on divorce court in one moment. You'll be put back together again the next. You'll be broke one day. You'll have a job the next who am I talking to who is ready to move out of your world of limitation take me past the outer court take me into the realm of no explanation put me in a place of supernatural are there any supernatural people in the house make a little noise if that's you hmm. I don't want to live contained by my flesh I don't want to be satisfied to survive Many people are living in that natural realm. They get promoted, but they still are in that secondary realm. And you're thinking a man is going to break you through, but God is about to usher you in to behind the veil living. <laughs> He's about to usher you in to behind the veil living, and you're going to see the glory manifest miracles in your life. Hear me in this house. I want to try to preach this as thoroughly and quickly as I can. But there were eight steps that took the common man with an uncommon anointing into the realm of no explanation. And what this is, if you really want me to be theological, this is really a plea for apologetic preaching. This is a plea for pastors again to stand up and preach doctrine in the church to preach foundational truth the blood of Jesus the cross of Christ the baptism in the Holy Ghost the power of healing and deliverance is there anybody that believes in the doctrines of the church and you believe that everything the Bible promises you is yes and amen let me hear from you if you believe that today now there were eight steps that took the common man into the uncommon realm, into the realm of no explanation. Number one, God had to be first. Now hang with me because this is going to be profound and powerful. When the children of Israel would walk through the desert and they were on that journey from Egypt, from Egypt into the promised land, when they stopped to make camp, the very first thing that they put up was the wilderness tabernacle. The tabernacle was the dwelling place for the presence of God. Before they put up their own tent, they put up his tent. Before they put anything up for themselves, they made sure that his place was put up. And then they built everything around the presence of God. In fact, every, every single solitary tribe from Dan to Beersheba, they camped round about the presence of God. Three to the north, three to the south, three to the east, and three to the west. They faced every tent toward the presence of God. Everything was built around God. God's presence. Everything thrived around God's presence. In fact, I don't want to be redundant, but I don't want you to miss it. They faced their tents towards the presence of God. Everything faced the presence of God, and his place was first. He wasn't second. He wasn't third. He wasn't somewhere on the list. He was 
first. He wasn't somewhere in the top 10. He was first. And the Bible says in Matthew 6, 33, Jesus makes it plain. And he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. He said, you got to put me first. Put me first in your marriage. Put me first in your money. Put me first in your life. Put me first in your ambitions. Put me first in your goals. Make me first. I don't fit on your list. I'm preeminent. I am God. I am first. Before me, there is no other. There's never been anyone like me because there never was anyone before me. I've never been second. I'm only going to be first. I've never been fourth or fifth. You're trying to get me to fix the top ten in your life and you ain't even got number one in place. God said if you'll put me first. All these things will be added unto you. Our problem is we are trying to get all these things and then add God to it. But God said, get your priorities in order. Build your life around me. Seek me first and all these things will be added unto you. Somebody give him praise right now if you want him to be first. Push your neighbor and say first. I want him first in my family. I want him first in my marriage. I want him first in my money. I want him first in my pursuit. I want him first in my desire. I want him first. Build your life around the presence of God. Make your giving and your worship a priority. Put him first. But then the secondary place that they had to deal with on their way to the realm of no explanation They had to come through a certain camp. Isn't it ironic that the camp they had to come through was Judah? Camp in front of the entrance to the tabernacle was not Manasseh. It was not the tribe of Benjamin, Dan or Beersheba, but it was the tribe of Judah. Now I know in function and formality the Levites were there, living in and out of the out of the wilderness tabernacle but understand you could not come into the presence of God without walking through Judah you could not even approach him until you walked through Judah what does Judah mean Judah means praise now now Judah somebody say Judah It's actually the Hebrew word yada. Yada means to throw up your hands in an expression of gratitude. Yada means like, thank you, Lord. (laughs) Thank you, Lord. I don't know how, but you did it. Thank you, Lord. I don't know how you made a way, but thank you, Lord. I don't know how the door opened, but Oh, y'all ain't helping me. I don't know how the body was healed, but thank you, Lord. I don't know how I even got saved, but thank you, Lord. I don't know how I didn't lose my mind when people were talking crazy to me, but thank you, Lord. Is there anybody that's got to thank you, Lord, in your spirit? You know at the end of the day, you only made it through what you made it through because Yahweh was on your side. And there's something inside of you that says, thank you, Lord. Yeah, yeah, thankful people don't care what anybody says about them. I dare you, throw up your hands and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that I'm saved. Thank you that I'm born again. Thank you that I got power over demons and devils. Thank you that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Thank you that no weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper. Thank you for where you brought me from. Thank you for how good you've been to me. Thank you for waking me up when I was asleep. Thank you for bringing me out of darkness and into... Thank you, Lord. Yada, 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 Judah, yada, Judah, yada. It means an expression of thanksgiving when you throw up the hands, but then you drop the H. We're about to go somewhere. Y'all don't get scared now. When you drop the H, it literally means sexual intimacy. It's the root word, yada, that means sexual intimacy. I know now some of y'all got scared when I started talking about that. But the Lord showed me something through this. He said, here's what I want you to teach the people. He said, you can't praise me and not get pregnant. Some of y'all women just panicked just then. 
I'm not talking about in the natural realm. He said, you can't praise me and not get pregnant with expectancy. You can't praise me and not get pregnant with purpose. You can't praise me and not get pregnant with a new dimension. He said, you can't praise me and not get pregnant with victory. See, the devil wants you to be barren. That's why he doesn't want you to praise. He wants you to come to church and just sit there because he knows the moment that you begin to praise God, God shows up in your praise and you get pregnant with the next season. I don't know about you. Is there anybody here ready for God to impregnate you as you praise him and say, God, don't let me live a barren life, but impregnate me with everything you have for me. Now, isn't it ironic that you had to come through Judah? Because when you transliterate and define the name Judah, Judah means praise. So God said, if you're going to come into my presence, if you're going to come into the miracle realm, you got to come through the camp of Judah. He said, if you want to come into my presence, he said, you can't program your way in. You can't legislate your way in. You can't dictate your way in. You can't command your way in. You can't confess your way in. The Baptists can't get you in. The assemblies of God can't get you in. That the coach can't get you in. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. The AME can't get you in. The Southern Baptists, the Northern Baptists, the Eastern Baptist or the Western Baptist can't get you in. The Southeastern Baptist, get y'all ain't saying, come on, come on, come on now, come on. The Methodist can't get you in. The Catholic can't get you in. A Pope can't get you in. A priest can't get you in. A bishop can't get you in. An elder can't get you in. An apostle can't get you in. A prophet can't get you in. A pastor can't get you in. A teacher can't get you in. Your mama can't get you in. Your daddy can't get you in. Your grandma that they can't get you in but you can worship your way in you can praise your way in you can shabak your way in you can judah your way in you can praise him until he says access granted you can somebody praise him like you're going in Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, you just sit there if you want to, but I'm going in. You, you just sit there and be religious, but I'm going in. I got to clap till I get in. I got I to gotta shout till I get in. I got to dance till I get in. I got to leap till I get in because I got to get in. That's why we've got to move beyond performance praise. We've got to recognize that when we come together, that they listen. I heard somebody, I heard about somebody who said, I didn't like the praise. Well, here's the good news. We wasn't praising you anyway. <laughs> Push your name and say, I'm going in. Another significant thing about Judah was this. Judah, praise, yada, yada. Somebody say, yada, praise, praise. It was always praise that was walking out front, leading the children of Israel through the desert. Always praise Judah in the hot times, Judah in the lean times, Judah in the lonely times, Judah in the thirsty times, Judah when you didn't even know where you was going, Judah when you didn't understand the journey, I wish somebody was here today, Judah when you didn't understand why you're on the path that you're on, you just had Judah out front. There are some people who think you made it through what you made it through because you are so scriptural, so literal, so denominational, so well connected. They don't understand that the reason you made it through the dry time, the thirsty time, the lean time, the lonely time, the desert time is because in spite of all that you saw and all that you felt and all that you were going through, there was something inside of you that said, I'm going to praise the Lord anyhow and I'm going to get Judah out front. Do I have any desert praises in the house? Have you ever praised him broke? Have you ever praised him sick? Have you ever praised him struggling? Have you ever praised him thirsty? Have you ever praised him when your children were going crazy? Have you ever praised him when you didn't even know what you were going to... I need somebody who's a desert praiser right now. Maybe you ain't seeing what you want to see, but say, God, I'm going to praise you because I know my praise will lead me because my praise attracts you. Ain't it something that not only did Judah lead through the desert, boy, I'm preaching today. I'm enjoying my own self, hallelujah. Not only did Judah lead through the desert, Judah came to the battlefield early. 
16 to 24 hours before they fought the Gergesites, the Hittites, the Amalekites, the Amorites, the Hivites. Come on. Some of y'all been fighting the bad Bossites, the Bill Collectorites, the demon possessed childrenites, the hard headed husbandites, the nagging wifeites. Some of y'all been dealing with the bill collectorites. Come on, somebody. And you, been, you had been able to handle it. But here's what Judah would do Judah would come out early with their tambourine. They would come out early with their drums. They would come out early with their trumpets. And they would meet on the battlefield where they were going to face the ites. And they would begin to praise God for the victory before they ever even threw a spear or shot an arrow. They would begin to praise God like they would already won before they had ever even gotten in the fight. See, anybody can praise him when you got everything you want and everything is lining up. You're married to Miss America. You got all the money you need. But when your kids are acting crazy, when you don't have a pot or a window, y'all don't make me preach. When you don't know what to do or where to turn, but there's something inside of you that said, I'm bringing my praise to my battle. And you get out there and before you even see the victory, you're already praising. Can you imagine how in Insulted the enemies of Israel were when they had to watch Israel dance and shout over the victory and the battle hadn't even taken place yet. I need somebody right now that's been in a fight that you know the enemy's been trying. I need you to insult the devil and let a praise rise out of your mouth and a clap get in your hands and a dance get in your feet because the Lord is on your side. Oh, who am I talking to? Praise him right now. Hallelujah, before you sit down, push three or four people and say, won't he do it? 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 So, my, my, my. God had to be first. Number two, you had to come through Judah. Somebody say Judah. But number three, understand this. There was only one door into God's presence. There was only one door. Somebody say one door. Now watch this. The tabernacle itself was surrounded by a fence that was 400 feet around. It was a white linen fence. It was a beautiful fence. But notice it was white linen and it was 400 feet around and it surrounded the entirety of the wilderness tabernacle and there was only one door. What I want to show you is this. There was something different about the door. The 400 feet of fence were white linen but the door was a different color. The door was purple and blue and scarlet. In other words, when you saw the door, you couldn't deny that it was the door because there was only one door in to God's presence. Now I know this is unpopular preaching. I know this is politically incorrect and I will probably get mail about this. And my email address is Troy at Calvary FL. Dot com. But we are in a season, Pastor Troy, where so many people don't want to hear this kind of preaching. They want to hear that there are many ways to God. They want to hear that there are many doors to God. But everything in the tabernacle is a type. It's a shadow. It's a clue of what's going to be manifested through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And I want you to understand there is still only one door into the presence of God. Jesus identified that door in John 10, 9. And he said, I am the door. He didn't say, I am one of the doors. He didn't say, there's a few doors plus me. He didn't say, I'm a door, and you know who else is a door? No, he said, I am the door. He said, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. I dropped by to tell somebody. It was that way thousands of years ago. It's that way today. If you want to come into God's presence, ain't but one door. Buddha can't get you in. Muhammad can't get you in. Allah can't heal your body. Krishna can't save your soul just one door his name is J-E-S-U-S 
He, he's different than everything else. He's different than everybody else. Everybody else that was supposedly a God lived and died never to rise again. But Jesus on the third day kicked the end out of the tomb and rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. He is seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and for I. He is the door. You need healing? Come through the door. You need deliverance? Come through the door. Tell your neighbor, I know the door. I, I know the door. I know the door. Come on, you, you come to the door and praise rings the doorbell. Come on, somebody. Praise gives you access. Now watch this. Not only was there one door, and not only was it different than anything else, who would admit that Jesus is different? He's different than anybody else. Ain't nobody like Jesus. Nobody compares to Jesus. But the door precious was actually 30 feet wide. The door was so big that they didn't even open the door. It was made of cloth. They rolled the door up. So the priest would walk into God's presence before he ever even got to approach God. He was already bowing down. He had to bow to come into his healing. He had to bow to come into his breakthrough. I can't even heal myself. I can't even deliver myself. Come let us worship and bow down. See, where are the people that know how to bow down? Where are the people that can say, God, I can't do it, but you can. I can't save them, but you can. So I'm going to worship and bow down. I'm going to bow down because you're greater than I am. I'm going to bow down because you can do anything. But check this out. The door is extra wide. Who ever heard of a 30-foot? wide door somebody say extra wide tell your neighbor extra wide you say why in the world would he make an extra wide door why 30 feet wide you know why baby because he had to make it extra wide for people like you and me so we could get in with all the junk in our trunk oh I don't have any church folk here yet how are you glad that you got in with all the junk in your trunk oh Oh, you sitting out there and acting cute now because you were in service and you were in second service at Calvary. But the truth is, you had some junk in your trunk. You got in with your bondage. You got in with your mess. You got in with your struggle. Somebody give God praise for an extra wide door. That's why we can't be religious. That's why we can't judge people that come to church. That's why we can't be mad if somebody is struggling in a lifestyle of sexuality and they are lost. We can't be upset about homeless folk and people that are jacked up and tore up because let me tell you the door is extra wide. It don't matter what you're dealing with. I'm glad you're here, baby. You can get in. If you ever got through the door, one, two, three, give God a shout. My, 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 tell your neighbor, I made it in. I made it in. I made it in. I made it in. I had trouble, but I made it in. But then he didn't stop there. Finally got through that door, and then he looks over here, and there's something called a brazen altar. He walks up to that brazen altar, and the brazen altar is a place of sacrifice. It's a place literally where the blood flowed blood was poured over that altar now we're going deep but understand it's types and shadows it's all a clue of what would be fulfilled through jesus and the holy spirit the brazen altar you ready it represents the cross of jesus christ now i know that a lot of people tell us now no need preacher to preach on the blood no need to talk about the cross no need to receive communion we are too culturally aware for that now that is slaughterhouse preaching that we don't need that kind of preaching anymore it's socially unacceptable we don't want people to have to contend with the cross and with blood and with things like this. But I want you to understand something. We cannot make it without the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm a blood preacher. Come on, I, I, I may pastor a mega church, and I'm thankful for that, and I give God all the glory for it. But let me tell you, mega church or not, I'm going to preach the blood. I'm going to preach this power, wonder-working power in the blood of Jesus Christ. I heard somebody say, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Somebody say remission. 
If you've ever dealt with cancer, what you most long to hear is that the cancer is in remission. The word remission means to dismiss, to send away. It means it was there, but it's not there now. When the doctor says your cancer is in remission, watch me now. He said, I've checked your blood. I've checked your sinews. I've checked your vital organs. I've checked your muscles. I've checked your brains. I've checked your cells. We can't find any cancer in your body at all because the cancer is in remission. It's been sent away. Some of y'all been having the devil beat you up over what happened five years ago. Some of you been having the devil torment you over what went wrong last year and how you acted in the 80s. Some of y'all old. Come on somebody. Some of y'all been tripping. You've been letting the devil lead you into condemnation and the devil is a liar. You need to rise up and say dog not one more day. Will you lead me into condemnation because my sin is in remission. See people don't know where you came from. They don't know what you've been through. They don't know the compromises that you made in your life. They don't understand how much is under the blood. But when you remember how much lives under the blood of Jesus, it ought to make her phrase rise up inside of you. Come on, if you've got some sin under the blood and it's been dismissed and sent away, lift up a praise before the Lord right now. Even back in the Old Testament, the Bible said, when I see the blood, not when I see your denomination, not when I see your spirituality, not when I see your bank account. No, he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. The word Passover in the Hebrew, it means to hop. It means to skip. It means to jump. He said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. The deaf angel can't touch you. When I see the blood, I will pass pass over you. How many times did the devil say, I got you now? How many times did the devil say, I'll take your children, I'll take your marriage, I'll take your career, I'll take your potential? That's why that wreck didn't get you. That's why that fever never got you. That's why you never died in that problem. That's why you couldn't commit suicide. That's why you couldn't give up. That's why that thing never completely destroyed you because the devil had eyes on you and he said, I got you now. But in the last moment, moment he saw the blood and he had to hop he had to skip and he had to jump see sometimes you need to praise God for what never got to you sometimes you need to praise God for how many things the blood of Jesus has absolutely hindered the enemy from manifesting in your life one two three give God a shout can I go just a little bit deeper Wave at me if you can handle a little bit deeper. Now watch this. It couldn't be just any blood. It had to be the blood of Jesus. I couldn't die for Evangelist Nathan. He couldn't die for Pastor Rayleigh. It had to be the blood of Jesus. Why? Well, I explain it like this. Before my wife had our baby girls, she was pregnant. Okay, it's been a long time for us, but is that still how it works? Wave at me if that's still how it works. Okay, now you knew that those babies were hers because they were nurtured in her womb. She provided for those babies a place to grow, a place to develop. In fact, when Dawn had a Twinkie, those babies had a Twinkie. When Dawn had chicken wings, those babies had chicken wings. Y'all, those were good days. I got the benefits of those days, but now she's got me on this plant paradox and the devil is a liar. Send chicken wings. Send, come on now. Send me Bethune Grill just as quick as you can. Come on, somebody. Did you say amen? Glory to God. No, she's saying don't send it. I'm not even going to call you a false prophet because I'll pray for that. But listen. When Dawn had a Twinkie, they had a Twinkie. That those babies developed in her womb. You knew when she birthed them, there was no denying that they were hers. But don't count Big Daddy out. I said, I did have something to do with it. Oh, y'all don't. Y'all don't make me. Come on. I said, I was a part of that process. And if you, there, there are a few ways to find out who the baby's daddy is. But the best way to find out who the baby's daddy is, the best way is check the blood. 
When you check the blood, you'll find out that I gave them their DNA, their deoxyribonucleic acid. Come on, somebody. I'm smarter than you think I am. I gave them their deoxyribonucleic acid. I gave them the genetic fingerprint that they have. Proof that they are mine and and I am theirs is the fact that genetically you can't deny what belongs to you. I'll put it to you like this. 2,000 years ago, there was a young virgin named Mary who inconceivably conceived, who conceived in such a way that it was unexplainable. She absolutely got pregnant by the Holy Ghost. Now, there's no denying who the baby's mother was. You check the baby, you know it's the baby's mother because she provided for that baby. She made a way for that baby. When she birthed that baby, you know it was hers. But if you want to know who the baby's daddy is, you got to check the blood. And when you check the blood, you'll find out the baby's daddy is the Holy Spirit, God himself. When you check the blood, you'll find out it was the one who told Moses in the desert, Moses, if you trust me, none of these diseases will in any way afflict you. It was the blood of the wonder worker, the way maker, the body healer, the soul saver. It was the one who said, with his stripes, you are healed. I wonder if there's anybody here thankful for the blood. Get your neighbor by the hand and say, neighbor, you just sit there, but I got to give God praise because I'm covered in the blood. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, now watch this. The next place that they stopped was the brazen lever. I'm moving quickly now. The brazen lever. It was made of the glass looking glasses of, of the women of Israel. It was a lever that the priests would come up to. And they would wash themselves that the leather was full of water. It was like a bowl full of water. And they would wet that, that rag. And they would wash themselves. And they would make sure they were cleansed. Mm because they had picked up some stuff in the process and they could not take this mess to the next level. Huh? See, some of y'all are about to go to another level, but there's some mess you got to leave behind. I'm leaving the drama behind. I'm leaving the unforgiveness behind. I'm leaving anything that's not like Jesus behind. I'm leaving it behind because I'm going to another level. Now check this out. They would stand there and they would wash their faces and they would clean themselves at this brazen lever. And it's powerful to me because the first time that these men and these priests were prepared they were washed by Moses and the Bible said that he washed them where with all but he said the next time is on you he said I'm going to wash you the first time but from here on out every time you're washed you got to wash yourself it represents sanctification let me get deep with you sanctification how do we how do we walk sanctified before the Lord here's how you do it the Bible said that you must cleanse it Ephesians 5 26 the church with the washing of the water of the word he said you got to get full of the word now let me tell you the brazen lever represents the word of God we look in that word and it's our mirror and we do what the word says we become what the word tells us to become. I don't look at Nathan and try to let pattern my life after him. He's not my mirror. Some of you have been trying to use other mirrors. You've been trying to use people. And you see, you're winding up being like a clown because it's a circus mirror because God hadn't called you to look at somebody else to learn to live. He's called you to get in the brazen lever. He's called you to get in the word. And when you get in the word, the word says, you know what? Marriage is between a man and and a woman, y'all ain't saying nothing. It tells you how to live. It tells you how to act. It tells you don't lust. It tells you don't live immorally. It tells you don't lie. It tells you how to live your life. The problem is we are living in a culture now where we are submitting to every lie of the enemy. But it is time for a sanctified church to arrive. And how often do you bathe? I hope you bathe every day. Your neighbor certainly hopes you bathe every day. You need to get in that word every day. 
Some denominations teach that sanctification is a separate work. Some, like the Assemblies of God, we teach that, 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 that sanctification is a progressive work. You say, well, pastor, is it a separate work that happens all at once, or is it a progressive work? Yeah, I, I don't know, because the truth is, some days I feel like it's all at once, and I'm completely sanctified. And then other days, somebody cuts me off in traffic, and then I realize I'm being sanctified a little bit at the time. But I don't care what it is. I want to get in that book. I want to be a word man. Tell your neighbor, I'm a word person. Yeah, I want to get in that word and I want to confess that word and say with his stripes, I am healed. I want to get full of that word and even if my children are acting crazy, I want to say as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I want to get full of that word and say blessed is he who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, Psalms chapter 1, nor stands in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law he doth meditate both day and night and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water and he shall bring forth fruit in his season and whatsoever he does it shall prosper so you get in that word you wash off the mess then you slip into the secondary realm I'm moving fast now the secondary realm you come and you go by the golden candlestick now the golden candlestick is where the fire and the oil meet. Glory be to God. It's where the fire and the oil meet. I it said it's where the fire and the oil meet. Oil is the emblem of the Holy Spirit. Fire is an emblem of the Holy Spirit. Oil represents the anointing. Fire represents the power of the Holy Ghost. When you come in this, a season like that, it's where your anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost converge. It's where you see things happen in your life because you are anointed and there's fire in your life, the fire of the Holy Ghost. I want to be in a church where there's fire. Come on, I want to be a church where there's a power of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you without shame that you are in a spirit-filled, fire-baptized church. Is there anybody that wants the fire? Make a little noise if you want the fire in your life. Come on, I said make a little noise if you want the fire in your life. I want it that way. I want it that way. I want it the axe way. I want it the drunk under the power way. I want it I can't hardly walk way. I want it where I intercede in the Holy Ghost. I want it. I want it. I want it. I, I want it. I want it. I want that fallout kind of Holy Ghost. I want that power kind of Holy Ghost. I want that demon chasing kind of Holy Ghost fire. I want that Holy Ghost fire that does the work of the Lord with boldness. How many if you want that fire get your neighbor by the hand and say neighbor say quick call 911 I'm on fire yeah 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 I'm on fire Holy Ghost fire I, I gotta learn to pray for people like Nathan I never see nothing like it he just says fire and 500 people fall out in the Holy Ghost David said I shall be anointed with fresh oil somebody say fresh oil Whew. oil is God's emblem of anointing in the Old Testament it represents God's endowment and God's endorsement in other words it's saying publicly God has chosen you but then he's also endued you in other words God's not going to choose you to do something and then not give you the power to do it David was anointed in one chapter with a hint of the anointing oil six quarts he stood there anointed with six quarts come on brother got an oil change and a lube job he was anointed in one chapter he got in a fight in the next chapter let me tell you something I hear people say I want to be anointed pastor I want to be anointed like you are you sure because the truth is, a war follows anointing. And if you're going to get anointed, you better know that war is going to follow anointing. And some of you need to understand you're in a season right now where you've been battling emotionally, where you've been battling in this season. But God brought me here to tell you, you got the anointment even before you got the appointment. Hallelujah. Give God a shout if you believe it today. Going to move quickly and then we come to the table of showbread. 
That's, that's number seven. Show bread is defined as this. Face bread. Show bread. Show up bread. Bread of his presence. Bread of his word. Hallelujah. The bread on the table represents the bread of God's presence and the bread of God's word. It represents his face drawing near. It represents the power of his word. All through the Bible, if you study about bread, it represents the word of God and the presence of God. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go to church where there's no bread. I got to have God's presence and I got to have God's word. Some of y'all need to understand that you're looking at your neighbor and you're glad they're here. But some of y'all are like me. You didn't come to see your neighbor. I didn't come to see your new dress. I didn't come to see your new wig. I didn't come to check out your weave. Y'all ain't saying nothing. I didn't come to see your new heels. I, I didn't come to see what you're wearing. I didn't come to hang out with you today. I, I'm glad to see you. But at the end of the day, I didn't come to see you. I came for the bread. Yeah, I came here because I need the presence of the Lord. Tell your neighbor, pass the bread. Pass the bread. Pass the bread. I need an encounter with God. Pass the bread. I need a breakthrough. Pass the bread. Make a little noise if you came for the bread. Tell your neighbor, I came for the bread. I came for the bread. I came for the bread. Some of y'all tripping. Because you never thought you'd have a white baker. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Some of y'all are tripping because you never thought you'd be in a Holy Ghost filled church. I feel like preaching. Some of y'all are tripping because you never thought you'd have a preacher like me that would stand up here and holler and sweat and look like a white man but preach like a black man. Where y'all at in the room? Some of y'all said, I didn't know I would come like that, but I didn't come because you're white. I didn't come because you're black. I didn't come because you're Hispanic. I came because you're making good bread in the house. I I came for the bread. I came for the presence of God. Can I get a witness? Now, here we are. That priest has come through this journey. And I'm going to try to wind this down. That priest, he began it building everything around God's presence. Then he comes, play children. Then he comes, they are my kids, come on. Paul said we have 10,000 instructors but only a few fathers. I'm interested in being a father. That, that, that captures my heart. That priest built everything around God's presence. He came through Judah, through praise, walked through one door. Jesus came to the brazen altar, the blood, the cross, came to the lever, the word changed by the word, washed by the water of the word. People don't even know what you used to be till you got full of the word. Came into the golden candlestick. Anybody filled with the fire? Anybody filled with the Holy Ghost? You got your oil and your fire. You came to the table of showbread. You loved his presence. You loved his word. And then the priest would stand there at the table of worship. This was called the altar of incense. And he would mix ingredients together. Exodus said, take stack the anica, galbanum, and pure frankincense. He said, of each there shall be like or equal weight. He said, these are to be stirred up and they are to be caught on fire. And the, and the smoke that rose when it was poured over that altar of incense represented the worship of the people of God as it rose. See, see, some of y'all trip out because Calvary gets a little bit loud and your neighbor is unpredictable. Some of y'all are like, I'm not going to sit here next week because she has swung her hair in my face this whole service. 
and what's a trip is when you move next week, she gonna move with you, so you just must sit there. Cause she is God's assignment in your life to stop worrying about people, worship and worship yourself. something inside of you says God I'm not just singing anymore I'm not just listening to the song <sighs> Lord I worship you and that priest would stand there watch this now he's been wearing a beautiful garment he's been wearing jewels he's even been wearing a crown but as he stands there now he's trembling he's about to go into the very presence of God he's about to slip behind the veil he starts taking off his crown. He starts taking off his jewels. He starts taking off the finery. He strips himself down into his linen undergarments. Come on. They were his drawers, y'all. They were fancy, but he was in his literal undergarments. And he was standing there. Now he's stripped down. And he said, this next realm is not about me. This next realm is not about my crown. It's not about, it's not about my jewels. I'm not going to shine in this next realm. Let me take off anything that is not like you. Come on. And he would stand there and as he's worshiping and trembling, knowing where he's headed, knowing where God is about to take him, they begin to pour the uncommon anointing oil over him. They rub him until his face shines. They rub him until he looks different. They rub him with the oil until it changes his countenance. They rub him with the Belial. Come on, I'm going deep, but it's the Hebrew. It's the oil that changes you. It's the oil that makes you different. The Bible talks about the Belial. It's the anointing oil that comes on you so strong that you ain't even who you used to be before you received it. It's the anointing oil that confuses the devil. It's the anointing oil that says one moment you didn't have it and the next moment you did. And when the devil sees you anointed, he sees you completely differently. He doesn't even see the limitations that you used to have it is that Belial and that priest stands there he trembles and he's pouring that worship over the over the altar of incense I can see him now he's emotional he's weeping he's ready take me into the realm of no explanation he's right there that oil is being poured over his head it's being worked in every part of his system the Bible said it's like the oil that came down upon the head the beard the skirts of Aaron's garment it completely covered him it completely consumed him it came down upon his head he got underneath it the head represents humility see there are some people they never know the fullness of the anointing because they've got too much stick and pride they think it's all about them their song their message their opportunity but when you learn to humble down that's when you're ready for miracles when you learn to humble down and say let me get under the anointing because the anointing is always greater than the anointed hallelujah it's always greater because the source is greater. He gets under it. It comes down upon his head. Yeah, I, I feel it even in the room right now. It comes down upon his head. Then it goes into his beard. The beard represents maturity. See, some people want this anointing, but they're not mature enough to handle it. They've got too many compromises and they're too childlike. They won't grow up. But God said, if I can bring that anointing to you, beard represents maturity. He said, you'll handle it properly. And there that priest is now. He's coming head to toe with that oil he has this uncommon anointing nobody has it but him everybody else has been common but now he is uncommon and what opens that realm to him is worship that last stop is worship that's why you've got to understand many of you get anointed and, and you stop at the anointing but that's a false finish line your, your hope is not the anointing your hope is the glory and the only way you get in the glory is you got to come by the table of worship you got to begin to say God I worship you I glorify you even when I don't understand Lord I don't even know what I'm going through right now and how I'm going to get out of it but God I worship you and you're going to take me into the realm of no explanation there that priest is he's trembling now his countenance has changed the oil has covered him he's now an uncommon man 
He's now headed into an uncommon realm. He's about to experience the supernatural in his life. He takes some of that, that, that those coals off of that altar of incense and he puts it in the censer and he thrusts it behind the veil. He thrusts it behind the veil and behind the veil, the presence of God where the Ark of the Covenant is, where the glory of the Lord is. It fills with worship and all of a sudden there that man is. There that man is. There he is. He's been a man before, but now he's an uncommon man. He meets the Lord. He slips behind the veil. Suddenly he's in the realm of no explanation. Suddenly things are happening that he can't explain. I stop by Calvary Christian Center and I wonder if there are any worshipers in the house. Is there anybody ready to go to that uncommon place? Stand up and give God praise if that's you. Now here's the key. God wants to anoint you with an uncommon anointing. God wants to anoint you to see the unexplainable. I heard the Holy Spirit just say to me, tell Nathan what he has seen up until this time is the tip of the iceberg. The Lord said there is so much more underneath that iceberg you're going to see in the next season, Nathan. You better get ready, get ready, get ready because there is an uncommon season that God is releasing in your life. The nations will know the power of a miracle working God. How many of you are ready to, to leave the outer court and the inner court and you're ready to go into the Holy of Holies? Raise your hands if that's you. 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 Raise your hands all in the balcony. Raise your hands if that's you. God's about to move you into the realm of no explanation. God's about to release an uncommon anointing over your life. Come on, sing this with me. Day and night, night and day, let incense. Sing, son. Night and day, let incense rise. Hold it. I want you to see yourself standing right at the table of worship right now. I want you to worship like the next realm is miracle realm. I want you to worship like the next realm is the realm of no explanation. I want you to worship like you're about to step into a season you've never dreamed or imagined. Hell, I also I feel the Holy Ghost in here. I want you to worship like something's about to open in your life. Sing it Sunday and night, day and day.
this room, hold them up by live stream around the world. Raise your hands up high. We're standing right now. We're standing right now at the table of worship. God is about to take you into the realm of no explanation, but he wants to release an uncommon anointing in your life. I believe that God is about to pour an uncommon anointing. This is more than just a message, more than just a prayer. This is an impartation. God is about to release an uncommon anointing in your life. You're going to pray this prayer after me. And I literally see fresh oil being poured all over this room, all around the world by live stream. I see the oil of the Holy Spirit about to be poured over everybody in this house today. Are you ready for the uncommon anointing? I want you to stretch your hands when we say the word now. When we say the word now, when you pray this after me, get ready, get ready. God is going to release it in your life. God is going to release it in your life. Pray this prayer. Pray it right. Pray it after me. Are you ready? Say in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Shout it out. Say in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I come to you, Lord. I come to you, Lord. I'm building my life around you. I'm building my life around you. I'm a praiser. I'm a praiser. I believe Jesus is the only way. I believe Jesus is the only way. I come through the door. I come through the door. I believe in the blood. I believe in the blood. I confess your word. I confess your word. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I need the Holy Ghost. I need the Holy Ghost. I need the fire of God. I need the fire of God. I want the bread of your presence. I want the bread of your presence. I want the bread of your word. I want the bread of your word. And I raise my hands before you. I raise my hands before you. I worship 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 you. Father God. Father God. Take me. Take me into the realm. Into the realm of no explanation. Of no explanation. In this moment. In this moment. I declare. I declare over my life. Over my life. The uncommon anointing. The uncommon anointing that gives me access. That gives me access. And I receive it. And I receive it.
Holy Spirit say he's not just going to be real. He's going to be real to you. I release you into a new season. I see pressure lifting off of your life. I see you walking into the realm of no explanation. I release over Natalie Wiles an uncommon anointing. It's going to fill your house. It's going to fill your house. It's going to fill your house. You're going to see breakthroughs, Natalie. You've been needing a fresh touch. While you've been doing for others, God said, I'm about to do for you. New anointing in the name of Jesus. One more time, raise your hands. You are worthy. what I taught today come on I know I taught longer but I'm not going to apologize for anything that the Lord does we are we are this we are in a unique time look at me in the eyes as your shepherd as your pastor as someone who loves you we are in unique days we are in days where God wants to pour his glory on his people there's a shift happening in the heavenlies and hot churches are about to get hotter and hotter and hotter Now, you say, well, pastor, you laid hands on a few people, but not me. Here's the good news. The Holy Spirit has already touched you. But tonight, we are very intentional. Tonight, there's going to be a phenomenal crowd. I know it because many of you are going to be here. And we are going to lay hands like Paul laid hands on Timothy. There was an imparting. And tonight, I believe there's going to be an impartation in your life. Tonight and Revival Wednesday, babe, we are moving forward in Revival. Can I ask this church, who's ready to move forward with Pastor in Revival? How many of you want a church just like this where it's a Revival house? I want you to bring your friends to this house. I want you to bring those that need this word. God's doing a new thing. Somebody say shift. Tonight the service starts at six. Come here, Nathan. How many of y'all love evangelist Nathan Morris? 
Come on, we love him better than that. How many of y'all really love him? You know, tonight we're going to be laying hands on every single person. Myself, Pastor Jim Rayleigh, Josh, and our guest tonight, Daniel Kalender, who has led million souls to Christ. It's going to be an incredible time in the presence of the Lord. It's going to get pretty wild in here. And we're believing that God is going to impart to you. How many have been part of Legacy over the last few days? What, can, can we just tell God what an awesome time we've had in His presence? So tonight is a night of impartation. We're going to lay hands on every single person. Don't want to miss it. Now, now listen, I'm going to ask for a favor. I'm tired. And I want to go home and take a nap. But I am coming back. I'm like Jesus. He's coming back and so am I. I, I want to meet you so bad. And anybody that knows me knows I love folk with all my heart. And I'd love to hug your neck. But I'm not going to go back this time. I'm going to send some of my staff back there. But if you'll come back next time. I'll give you the biggest hug you ever had. I'll give you that L.A. hug, that lower Alabama hug. Come on, because I'm so glad that you're here. Pastor Josh, would you go back there and meet people? And, and how many of you sense that the Lord has brought an uncommon anointing into your life? How many of you want this to be more than just a message? You want it to be an absolute life change. Pastor Josh is going to close us in prayer. I, listen, you're my favorite. Tell your neighbor, I'm pastor's favorite. You are absolutely my favorite. All right, Pastor Josh, you close us out. Six o'clock tonight. We're all going to meet back again for revival. But here in house today, as you leave, please know that we're still right in the middle of group signups. So make sure if you're not part of a small group. How many believe that we could take this kind of atmosphere into our small groups and see revival spread across this entire region? I believe it. So make sure you sign up for a small group. And I just believe that the best is yet to come. Amen. Father, we thank you for all that you've done today and in this conference. But God, all that you've done has been nothing more than a preview of what you're about to do in us. We're ready. We're hungry. In Jesus' name, pour it out. Amen and amen. God bless you. Hug a few people. Shake a few hands. We love you so much. And we'll see you back here 6 p.m. tonight.